I'm going to show you how to make this healthy oatmeal cookie cereal. It has the same amount of calories and ingredients as a bowl of oatmeal. Add one cup of oat flour, four tablespoons sugar of choice, a third cup almond flour, two tablespoons of chocolate chips, quarter teaspoon baking soda, a tablespoon of nut butter, a splash of vanilla and five tablespoons of almond milk. Mix it up until you get this delicious cookie dough batter. Scoop out the batter and roll into balls with your hands. Place balls on a lined baking tray. Use a fork to press down into a cookie shape. Bake at 180 degrees Celsius until golden brown. Best stored in an airtight container. Like a glass jar that's easy to access in the morning. I make a big batch of these in the week and enjoy with some ice cold almond milk. I got a basil plant recently and have yet to kill it, so let's make some pesto. Start by toasting some pine nuts and then place the toasted pine nuts in a food processor or a blender. Add your salt, garlic, parmesan, fresh basil, of course, olive oil, and then blend it all up. Then I like to scrape down the sides and blend it up one last time. Pesto is actually really great to freeze and when you're ready to use it, you can just thaw it in the fridge. Today I'm using this pasta shape called treche. Salt your boiling water, Boil up the pasta till al dente and be sure to reserve a bit of the pasta water. Add the pesto to the pasta, the pasta water, and that's it. Give it a mix. This pesto is super simple, perfect, herbaceous. I love it. Top it with some parmesan if you like. Now let's just hope my basil plant grows back because I totally mulled it for this TikTok video. Gabby and I are in New York and every time I go home I dream of these pancakes. They're like crispy outsides, gooey in the middle. We're going to breakfast by Salt Cure, so let's go. Last time I got the banana nut, but I think I'm gonna get the OG today. Okay, so Gabby and I both got the OGs. Look at the cinnamon butter melting, it's actually heavenly. And then we got a soft scramby and some sausage to split. See the crispy edges, that is what makes it. So this Sunday night, I want another ice cream sandwich and I'm craving two soft and chewy s'mores cookies with a layer of vanilla ice cream in between. And for this one, I use homemade marshmallows, sourdough graham crackers, and the cookies are sourdough and naturally fermented, so they're gut healthy and it baked up perfect. Before you know it, those cold winter mornings will be here and you need to make these delicious chocolate chip pancakes. These are the best pancakes you'll ever have. I promise. Let's make them. You're going to need one and a quarter cups of buttermilk, one tablespoon vanilla extract, two tablespoons of granulated sugar, one egg, four tablespoons of unsalted melted butter. Give that a good mix. Add one and one third cups of all purpose flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, one quarter teaspoon of kosher salt and one quarter teaspoon of ground cinnamon. I heard years ago that cinnamon brings out that chocolate flavor, whether or not that's true. I love the flavor it adds. Don't overmix, add one cup of semi-sweet chocolate chips, fold them in, and let the batter rest for about five minutes. I like to use about half cup of batter per pancake. Spread it out a little bit, cook in a buttered skillet for three minutes on each side. I like to add more chocolate chips, by the way. Do not flatten the pancakes. When you flip them, only flip them once, but definitely bring in the runny edges in like that. Smother them with syrup and enjoy. Let's make alu burrata. My mum taught me how to make these super soft burrata filled with a delicious spicy potato filling. One of my favourite comfort foods. For the dough, to some flour, add some key or oil, some salt or water to knead, form into balls and keep aside for about an hour. For the filling, to some boiled potato, add some red onion, coriander, green chilies which are optional and a whole bunch of spices which are all listed in the caption. Mash together so that it easily forms a ball and then we place that into the dough, flatten with a rolling pin and then pan fry, brushing with oil every minute. I flip it a couple of times until it's nice and golden and that's your delicious burrata ready enjoy it while it's still nice and hot i don't like fancy cupcakes i prefer classic homemade super soft chocolate cupcakes with cream cheese frosting they're my absolute favorite let me show you how i make them the dry ingredients include all-purpose flour unsweetened cocoa powder salt baking powder and baking soda give that a quick mix or sift it Add some semi-sweet chocolate chips to some boiling hot water and let it sit for a few minutes. Mix the wet ingredients, which include oil, buttermilk, one egg, vanilla extract, sugar, and sour cream. Mix until smooth, then add the dry ingredients. And while that mixes, pour in the water chocolate mixture. Don't overmix, but make sure to scrape the sides and bottom of the bowl. 
Bake at 350 degrees for 16 minutes. Don't overbake, otherwise they will turn out dry. For the cream cheese frosting, you'll need softened cream cheese and softened unsalted butter, some powdered sugar, and that's it. Mix for three to four minutes or until fluffy. Let the cupcakes cool completely before frosting. Serve with a cappuccino or a glass of milk. Decorate them with some sprinkles if you want, and that's pretty much it. Enjoy. If you're in the mood for a fancy meal without the fancy price tag, make this creamy pesto annulotti. I'm using this recipe in my cookbook as a general guide to follow along with. Start with some flour on a flat surface, make a well, add in the eggs and some olive oil. So at this point, my pasta wall collapsed and I had no choice but to keep going. And I can promise you that in 10 minutes time, it came together into a nice, supple, smooth pasta dough ball. Let the dough ball rest for at least 30 minutes, then chop up some spinach, add it to a heated pan without any oil and let it just release all of its liquid. In a bowl, combine ricotta, the spinach, pecorino, Romano, lemon juice, lemon zest, garlic powder, salt, and pepper. Get everything well combined, then transfer it to a Ziploc bag inside of a cup, and there's your filling. For the pesto, toss garlic cloves, spinach, almonds, pecorino romano, salt, and sugar into a food processor, then pour in some olive oil to thin it all out. At this point, you can go back to your pasta dough on a floured surface and cut it up into four equal parts. Flatten out each part with your hand, and then run it through the pasta roller at setting one three to four times. Dust with flour whenever the dough gets a little sticky, then run it one time each through settings two to six until you can just barely see through the dough. Slice the pasta sheet in half and then pipe a straight line of the ricotta spinach filling directly across. Fold it over, pinch it shut, and then what you're gonna do is take your fingers and create little sections of agnolotti by squeezing out the filling, if that makes then sense. Then take a pasta cutter and cut where the section is made so you have individual pieces, pinch it shut on the side so it doesn't seep through, and just repeat this step for the rest of your pasta. Then place these in the fridge for about 10 minutes to let them harden up. Set up a two-step cooking station with a pan on medium heat and then a pot of boiling water, add in the annulotti, and as soon as it floats to the top, you're gonna add some pesto to the other pan, and then drop in all of your cooked annulotti. Toss it with the pesto, then pour in some heavy cream, and within seconds, it's gonna get nice and thick because of all that starch in the fresh pasta. Top this off with pecorino romano, a fresh squeeze of lemon juice, and it's ready to enjoy. Another favorite pancake in Manhattan has been unlocked with this super thick and cakey pancake. With a slight crisp and a huge round of salted butter on top, these pancakes come pre dust in syrup and they remind me of my all-time favorite pancakes from Chez Maton in more ways than one. These are a little denser and more moist with more chew, almost like a mochi pancake. I absolutely love them and highly recommend adding them to your table as a brunch dessert. Making pasta from scratch can be one of those intimidating tasks, but it really doesn't have to be. There are quite a few pasta shapes that only use flour and water in their dough and require no pasta machine. And one of those shapes is cavatelli and that's what we're making today. So the dough is just semolina, warm water, and salt, and you just want to knead it for about seven to 10 minutes until it's nice and smooth. Then it just needs to rest for an hour and that's it for the dough. And I'm making a pesto to go with the cavatelli today because there's just something so comforting about a nice big bowl of pesto pasta in the summertime. It reminds me of when my mom would bring in a bunch of basil from her garden and whip up a big batch. So I blanched a bunch of basil and then blended the pesto until smooth in a blender, which I know is not quite traditional, but I really like it for this. The pesto stays nice and green and really coats the cavatelli very nicely. And once the dough is rested, you just roll portions out into a log and then cut them into pieces. Then you take each of those pieces and use the back of a knife to almost roll it over on itself. And if you have a gnocchi board you can roll them over on that so they have ridges or you could just do it on a cutting board and they're just as good. I just boil them till they float and they're al dente about five to seven minutes and then I like to toss them in a little bit of pasta water and butter. Then I take a dollop of our pesto and toss that all up. And I just love how that smooth pesto coats the cavatelli so beautifully. Then I top it with a bunch of pecorino and black pepper and it's such a simple beautiful summer pasta. We had a dinner party last night and one of the things that I made and served was homemade garlic naan and there was none left on the table. This recipe came out perfect, so I'm going to share with you guys how I made it. To begin, we're going to mix together our yeast mixture, cover it with a damp cloth, and let it rest for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, we're going to add in the rest of our ingredients and you can either knead it by hand or use a stand mixer and we're going to knead for about 10 to 15 minutes until your dough is nice and smooth. Add your dough to a floured bowl, cover it with a damp cloth, and let it rest in a warm place for about an hour and a half. Once your dough has doubled in size, we're going to separate it into about 14 mini dough balls, and we're going to cover them and let them rest for another 15 minutes. 15 minutes later, we're going to roll out our dough about a quarter of an inch thick, and then we're going to slightly stretch it out, and you want to let it rest for another 10 minutes before you add it to your hot cast iron. Make sure you preheat your cast iron for about 5 minutes on medium heat before you add any of your dough, and we're going to cook our naan for about 2 minutes on each side. Mix together your ghee mixture and brush it on your fresh naan. And for more in-depth instructions, make sure to head to my blog because I was able to touch on so much more there. And you're done. The mini all-American cakes with fudge icing have made their return to the Costco bakery. These are huge and they're also to die for. These are one of my all-time favorites.
Here's a recipe using just a few ingredients that you probably already have in your kitchen. Start by peeling one potato and cut it into pieces. Boil this in salted water until it's soft, and then you wanna mash it, and I'm using a racer just to make it easier. Add cornstarch and sugar, and these aren't overly sweet, but you can leave out the sugar if you want. Roll the potatoes into a ball, flatten it and add the cheese, and then cover it, flatten again, and clean up the sides. Then just shallow fry it until they're golden brown on both sides. Let me introduce you to a croissant cookie. If you happen to be in Paris, you can find this in the Salon T slash cafe. They have a boulangerie in the back. Now, like any boulangerie in Paris, you can find good looking cakes. But a croquis, this is your spot for sure. It's still warm, I can feel it through the paper. Look at this beauty. I know you've seen it already. I'm gonna flip it so you can see the back. Okay, definitely on the buttery side. Cookie, croissant, magic. But is it good? And yeah, it's cold and rainy outside. Oh my God, it's delicious. This melty chocolate chips can stop looking at it and eat it. It's literally intertwined with the croissant. This is one of the best, most decadent pastry I've had. Definitely for chocolate lovers. What are you having tonight for iftar? I'm having this super stretchy, creamy mac and cheese. Which is so simple to make and so addictive. It's the first thing to be finished on the dinner table. First, you're going to start off with parboiling your pasta. And mixing that with butter. In the meantime, you're going to melt some butter on a pan on low heat and season it. You want to cook off the seasonings in the butter. This will maximize the flavor and season your mac and cheese right. Without it tasting so powdery. Then you'll do the same with the flour. By cooking it off for a few minutes so it doesn't give a raw taste. Gradually add your milk and cream. And don't worry too much if it's not thick yet. You want it slightly runny so when you add the cheese, it thickens up. Then to the macaroni, I'm going to use the spare cheese to mix it all up. I use cheddar for cheesiness, red leicester for a sharp taste, and mozzarella for texture. Just listen to how good that sounds. That's when you know you're going to make a perfect mac and cheese. I use leftover sauce and extra cheese as topping. To bake this, you don't want to overcook it and let it curdle. For that creamy stretchiness, bake for 25 minutes at 170 degrees. And it's literally perfect. I hope you enjoy this recipe. Bye. These are the best, the best brownies I've ever had, just no doubt. It's Ramadan, so my sleeping schedule is completely flipped. So at 2 a.m., we decided to bake brownies. For the base brownie recipe, I used Heat to Handle's classic chewy brownie recipe. We decided to just spruce it up and add some salted caramel in the middle, and it just really took it there. Again, the brownie recipe in itself is so good, but that salted caramel in the center just... Wow. I'm going to write the full recipe in the caption, so find it there. You guys have to try these. I love cinnamon rolls, but most of the time I am not willing to wait for the dough to rise and for all the effort it takes to make individual cinnamon rolls. And so instead what I do is make this delicious cinnamon roll cake, which is topped off with a cream cheese frosting and literally tastes like a cinnamon roll, but in a cake. So let's make it together today. This recipe is super easy. We are going to start by combining our brown sugar and our eggs and whisking this until they're nice, light and fluffy. And then to this, we're going to add sour cream, which will keep our cake so moist and tender for so long. And then we're going to add oil, a good amount of vanilla extract. You don't want to shy away from that. And then also our butter, and then just whisk all of our wet ingredients together. Once our wet ingredients are well combined, we will add all the dry ingredients, which includes the baking powder, the cinnamon, the salt, the flour, and just whisk everything together really well till you have your cake batter. And now that our cake batter is complete, it's time to layer it just like how you have those layers in a cinnamon roll. So this is the important step, which really makes it a cinnamon roll cake. And so to do this, you're going to start by spreading a thin layer of cake batter in an eight by eight square pan, and then top that off generously with brown sugar and cinnamon, and then layer it three times total. So you get beautiful, delicious ribbons of cinnamon going through your cake batter and it bakes perfectly. And then before putting this cake in the oven, I do like to top it off with a good amount of white sugar on top just so that it gets a nice, crispy, sweet topping. It's just so amazing and delicious. Trust me on this one. Once our cake has baked, we will allow it to cool completely. And then after it has cooled, we will top it off with an amazing cream cheese frosting. This cake is sweet because it does have the layers of cinnamon and brown sugar and then the white sugar topping on top. And so the cream cheese glaze is super important because it just balances out everything so well and really makes it a cinnamon roll cake. Once our cake is iced, all that's left to do is to serve it up and enjoy. And I guarantee you that whether you like cinnamon rolls or not, you are bound to love this cinnamon roll cake. It is just so delicious and the flavor combinations suit each other so well. The layers of cinnamon throughout the cake and the cake batter is so moist and tender. And that amazing cream cheese glaze on top is just divine. So I really hope you try this recipe and thank you so much for watching.
This is your sign to do a candy bar making night. My sister is a lover of all things sweet and yesterday was her birthday so I figured this could be cute and let me tell you it's one of my favorite activity nights I've hosted. It was a blast, everyone had a great time and of course the result was something delicious. It's also rather simple to host, all you need to do is get some silicone molds which I'll link in the comments, your favorite chocolates, we had dark milk, semi-sweet and white and all the fillings you like. Then all you have to do is make your bars, stick them in the freezer for about 10 minutes and you're good to go. This Twix one was delicious. There were so many good ones and this pretzel brownie one was also so good. Try it out.